Get excited, folks. The Orioles have traded for a starting pitcher, and we'll tell you who it is coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Pod Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, December 19th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are looking at the Orioles' first trade of the offseason. Was it a big one? No, it was not, but they have brought in at least some pitching depth to help the team in 2024, acquiring right-handed pitcher Jonathan Heasley from the Kansas City Royals for one low-level Dominican Summer League prospect. We will talk about Heasley's career so far in the bigs with the Royals since 2021. We will talk about his stuff on the mound, how it plays, how the Orioles can improve it, and we'll talk about what his role could be with the O's in 2024 and moving forward, and then take a look at the young minor leaguer that the Orioles gave up in the deal, and if this has any impact on the Orioles' bullpen and rotation next season. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by FanDuel. Every moment, you can make it more with FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks just if your team wins. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started today. So the Orioles made a move here and they actually made this move kind of right around. They were finalizing their new lease on Monday. So talked about it briefly on Monday night's live episode when we mostly talked about the new lease agreement the Orioles have for potentially 30 years to stay at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Make sure to go back and check out that episode if you haven't already, but wanted to dive deeper into this trade because, listen, when we saw Jeff Passan tweet on Monday that the Orioles have traded for right-handed pitcher blank, you thought if Passan's tweeting about it and it's an Orioles trade for a right-handed pitcher, they might have gotten a legit guy. That's not really the case here. The guy is Jonathan Heasley. He is a major league pitcher, You can't really say much more than that at this point. But first, let's get into, okay, who is Jonathan Heasley? First of all, he is not Dylan Cease. And quite frankly, I would be surprised if Heasley even started one game for the 2024 Baltimore Orioles. It's possible, but in a perfect scenario, he doesn't. So that's kind of your first look at this guy. This is not really a rotation candidate for next year. Now, if injuries happen, he's a depth guy, certainly. But he's not someone who's coming in thinking, you know, I'm gunning for that number five spot in spring training. Jonathan Heasley is a 26-year-old right-handed pitcher who turns 27 in January and was a 13th round pick of the Kansas City Royals back in 2018 out of Oklahoma State. The Royals, the only organization he has been with until yesterday's trade. Now, the Orioles have a history with Oklahoma State players. They've drafted multiple of them over the past few years. Of course, Jackson Holiday was committed to Oklahoma State to play for his uncle. His dad played there. A lot of his families played there. So the Orioles have these Oklahoma State connections. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much of a part that played here, but it's certainly nice to have other people. You can ask about this guy and, and find out a little bit more uh, in terms of what he can do on the mound. But he got into the Royal system, started working through the lower levels in 2019 and 2020 as a starting pitcher. Of course, the, or excuse me, 2018 and 19, 2020 minor league season was canceled, but he began the 2021 season in double A with the Royals. And it was a, a pretty nice jump, you know, for a 13th round pick to already be in double A. And he was pitching very, very well, 105 and a third innings, a 3.33 ERA with a 28% strikeout rate and just an 8% walk rate. Really, really good in double A for the Royals in 2021 and he was a little bit older because he was a college draft pick and the Royals just decided we need a little help here at the end of the 2021 season let's just call him up so Heasley ends up being a September call up for the Royals in 2021 he makes three starts to finish off the season that year and it wasn't great 14 and two-thirds innings eight runs only six strikeouts three home runs but he got his feet wet in the big leagues and he completely skipped over triple a to go to the big leagues now he went into spring training of 2022 with the royals thinking he had a good shot to win a rotation spot unfortunately he did not and heasley was sent to triple a to begin the 2022 season his first stint in triple a now he was all right 
You know, he had a, a four-ish ERA in 26 or so innings in AAA, but the Royals needed a starter. And so on May 12th of 2022, he was recalled to join the Royals rotation. And he did go up and down a little bit throughout that 22 season, but generally he spent most of the rest of the year in the Royals rotation. Ended up making 21 starts for the Royals in that 22 season. Didn't go great. Had a 5.28 ERA and a 5.67 FIP in 104 innings. Only a 15% strikeout rate, which isn't horrendous, but it's not very good. And you pair that with a 10% walk rate, which is not good at all. It was a tough kind of first, not completely full, but mostly full big league season for Jonathan Heasley. Now, he was much better in the second half of the year, which the Royals were feeling good about. He had a sub-4 ERA in August and September, and even in September, his ERA was right around three, so he was good down the stretch, but nothing in the data, nothing in the pitch mix really super stood out in that 2022 season. Sometimes you'd see the changeup dominating, sometimes the curveball, sometimes the fastball looked good, but he never completely put it all together. But he thought, you know, I finished strong, maybe I can make this rotation in 2023, and the Royals didn't exactly have, you know, the who's who of rotation candidates this year. But he still didn't make the rotation and did not make the team out of spring training for the second straight year. Started the year again in AAA Omaha this season, but this season looked a lot different for Heasley. Not only did he spend much less time in the big leagues in 2023, he also got moved into the bullpen. Now, when he went to AAA, he worked as a starter, but he only had one big league appearance until July when he was recalled as a reliever by the Royals on July 4th. And he spent about five weeks in the big leagues until August 12th as a relief pitcher. And it started off well. First seven appearances out of the bullpen for him. Seven innings, one run, four hits, five Ks, no walks, and a 54% ground ball rate. He was looking like, at the very least, a nice, solid middle relief piece for the Royals. Then things started to go downhill into early August, and he was sent back down to AAA in mid-August. And that is where he spent the rest of the 2023 season And quite frankly, it's not like he got better down there, down the stretch in the AAA bullpen. It was a 4-4 ERA in 20 innings. It wasn't anything super great, and he walked 11 batters and only struck out 16. So he was kind of at the point where he was on the Royals 40-man roster this offseason, but hadn't given him a lot in the last year. And if you've seen, the Royals have really been adding to their team. They have been maybe the most active team in terms of the number of players they've acquired in free agency. They've brought in Chris Stratton and they've brought in Will Smith to add to the bullpen. They've brought in Hunter Renfro for the outfield and they've added Michael Waka and Seth Lugo to the rotation. They are actually spending some money in free agency, but because of that, they've already added five, six big league players. You need to clear some space on your 40 man roster. And when the Royals signed Michael Waka the other day, their 40 man roster was already full and they had to make a decision. And that decision was going to be a DFA for Jonathan Heasley. And I think they made that known and the Orioles swooped in because, you know, the O's had the 101 win season. The Orioles are very far down on the waiver wire. So even though Heasley hasn't been great, he's a fairly young guy with a lot of team control who's pitched in the big leagues. A, probably a rebuilding team was going to claim him and he was never going to get to the Orioles. So the O's clearly saw something they wanted. So they just jumped on it and they end up making the trade to at least go and get Heasley and say, you know what, let's go after him. He'll be our guy, at least for now. They sent 18-year-old right-handed pitcher Cesar Espinal, who's pitched in the Dominican Summer League for the past two years for the Orioles, over to the Royals in the deal, and we will get to Espinal a little bit later. But that's kind of the gist of who Heasley is. Now, maybe his most notable moments probably both came in 2022. I would say the first one is the best game of his career, came against the Orioles June 10th, 2022 at Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City. This is kind of before the Orioles got going in 2022. This was before the 10-game winning streak in late June and early July. He threw seven scoreless innings, one hit, seven Ks, and no walks against the Orioles that day. So the Orioles got to see him at his best up close. And also, kind of notable for during one of his starts in 2022, he was scoreless in the fifth inning, was pitching well. All of a sudden... He vomits on the bound and has to come out of the game. He said after the game, I wasn't sick. It's just an adrenaline thing. He said it's happened to him multiple times before in pro ball and used to happen before every high school football game that he played back when he was uh, in Plano, Texas, where he grew up. So, yeah, an interesting cat, a guy who, you know, has had some prospect pedigree, some, not a lot, but some. Now, in the big leagues, 
This year, again, he ended up 12 appearances, 15 innings, a 7-2-0 ERA, five homers, only a few strikeouts, and, and really no walks at all, but it, it wasn't super impressive, and his move to a reliever didn't do that great because he didn't spend all that much time in the Royals' bullpen this season. So now you look at, okay, what, what can the Orioles do here? Like, what do they see here? What are they going to try to do here to make him at least a serviceable option at the big league level on the mound? That's what we'll get to coming up next. What does this pitch mix look like? And what are the Orioles seeing here to try to fix Jonathan Heasley? And what role could he play if they do so in 2024? But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. We are going down the stretch of the NFL season here. And you, well, you can score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 just if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So we're back here talking about the newest Oriole. That is Jonathan Heasley, right-handed pitcher who the Orioles acquired in a minor trade with the Kansas City Royals on Monday. And, you know, we talked about how it hasn't gone amazing in his big league career so far. But here are some of the pluses that the Orioles get in Jonathan Heasley. First of all, he has one minor league option year left. What that means is he can be optioned freely up and down between Norfolk and Baltimore in the 2024 season without the Orioles having to DFA him. Now, with the new rules, you can only be optioned five times in a year, but the Orioles will have those five times that they can option Heasley if they want to this season. Also, if the O's can fix him and turn him into at least a serviceable major leaguer, he's got a lot of team control left. He is not even arbitration eligible until after the 2025 season, so he's basically making the minimum for another two years. And if they really figure it out and they're like, hey, this guy's a solid reliever that we can keep around, he's not a free agent until after 2028. That's right, 2028. So we'd have five years of team control of Jonathan Heasley if the O's can turn him into something here. Now, with the trade, they put him on their 40-man roster. So that takes the Orioles' 40-man roster to 38 players, which means they still do have two open spots as they go through this offseason and get closer and closer to the new year. But I will say before I even get into anything, there is a chance that the Orioles try to, at some point this offseason, sneak him through waivers and keep him in the organization. They've done it with plenty of guys in the past. We know last year the big one was they did it with Ryan O'Hearn, traded for him, snuck him through waivers, kept him on the team. This offseason they've already done it with Tucker Davidson, where they claimed him on waivers and then they snuck him through waivers and kept him in the organization. Could totally happen with Heasley just because they got him via trade and not waiver claim. This is basically a waiver claim, right? He was about to be DFA'd. The Orioles threw the Royals basically a nothing prospect to get him back. So he could be DFA'd at any point. The O's would try to keep him in the org, but that's certainly on the table here. Now let's talk about the pitch mix for Heasley because it's certainly a starter's mix, right? He hasn't, even though he did work mostly out of the bullpen this season, he hasn't made that transition that starters will make when they go to the pen and say, all right, I'm going to cut down on my stuff. I'm only going to throw my two or three best pitches, and I'm going to get rid of the other pitches that I only really used in the past to kind of get me through you know, an entire game two or three times through the order. The main pitch is still the four-seam fastball. Threw it 45% of the time this year. That's been about normal for Jonathan Heasley. Now, it averaged about 95, which is up from around 93 when he was a starter. So when he was working out of the bullpen this year, it was up at 95, which is a good sign. And he topped out you know, around 90, 98, 98.5 miles per hour out of the Royals' pen this season. So good to see that at least the fastball is playing up. It's a pretty good pitch, right? Opponents don't square it up. It's got a good spin rate, so it's kind of got that rising action on it. I think that's that's a good sign. You know, it's, it's at least a really solid four-seam fastball and a good base for any pitcher. Now, he's also got a sweeper. That is kind of the new craze of the, the more sweeping slider. Now, a general slider moves right to left for a righty, but also down as well. The sweeper has more horizontal movement, like straight across the strike zone. That is the breaking ball that he throws. Now, he introduced the sweeper in 2022, threw it sparingly, but did throw it a lot more 
in the big leagues this season. Now, it did have a 32% whiff rate, which is quite good. Opponents also slugged 786 against it. Quite not good. Now, remember, he only had, those are big league stats. He only threw 15 innings in the big leagues in 2023. But it's a pitch that he's got to work on. And it is interesting because he used to throw a regular slider as well to go along with the sweeper. And he originally, when he first had a slider, it was just a kind of more natural gyro slider. And now he's been working at Tread Athletics this offseason, one of the workout facilities that's similar to Driveline and others that tries to improve pitchers throughout the offseason. And one of the things, there's been some really good videos on their YouTube page, on their social media with them working with Jonathan Heasley. And one of the things they've talked about is maybe reincorporating that regular looking gyro slider that maybe actually could be better for him. And maybe the Orioles do see that as well. And, and that pitch only had a 224 batting average against it when he threw it a lot more in 2022. So maybe he will bring it back. Now, he's also got a curveball, which to me is his most intriguing pitch. Now, it only had a 19% whiff rate, but opponents hit only 167 against it. And last year, righties hit only 154 against it. That pitch is certainly a weapon for Heasley. And some of the stuff I've seen, it's got a good spin rate, and that might be an out pitch for him. And then the last pitch is the changeup. This is a really interesting offering for him. Now, he didn't throw a lot of pitches this year, right, because he only threw 15 innings. But he only threw 23 total changeups. And if you go back and read some of the write-ups from Eric Loggenhagen at Fangraphs when Heasley was a prospect, back in the day with the Royals, again, he was a 13th round pick out of college. It's not like this guy was ever a high prospect. But he was kind of a bottom part of the top 30, ranked in like the, the low 20s, essentially, in terms of the Fangraphs prospects list when he was on them in 2020 and 2021 for the Royals. So he's still somewhat of a known name in their system. But he was talked about as, hey, he's got good spin on his slider, good spin on his fastball. And if he does become a reliever, Long and Hangen wrote about how he could see him just becoming a fastball changeup reliever. Thought that might have been his best off-speed pitch, that changeup. But he hasn't really thrown it much at all. Now, the Orioles have been great with developing changeups for their pitchers. If Heasley's already coming in with a changeup that he seemingly trusted in the minors and is kind of trusted less and less in the majors, he's already got a baseline for it. Maybe the O's can help him go and find it. And again, you know, the O's have picked up some other interesting guys off waivers or these minor trades where there's more of a key thing, like one tool that they do really well. Like when they picked up Tucker Davidson earlier this offseason, I talked about that splitter is nasty. He just found out how to throw it in like the final two months of this season. The Orioles are going to work with it. That could be a really good pitch. Remember when the O's got Ryan O'Hearn? It was like he's really in his head, but when he makes contact with the ball, it goes. All of a sudden they fix him. O'Hearn's an amazing and crucial part of the 2023 Orioles. There's guys that they go and get. We even talked about it with, you know, Jorge Mateo with the speed. Jorge Lopez, when they brought him in on waivers, like if they can just shorten the pitch arsenal and make him a reliever, he could be really good. Oh, yeah, he becomes an all-star. Like you can see these things when these guys come in. It's not as apparent, at least through the research and the baseball reference page, about what would really make Jonathan Heasley special. But maybe... It's a different way that he helps out the Orioles. Maybe he doesn't turn into a, you know, lockdown seventh inning reliever. Maybe that's not his future. And, you know, I don't see the O's turning him in, into like even an Austin Voth style, like good starter where Voth was just failing and failing and failing with the Nats. The Orioles got him, said, this is what you're doing wrong. And all of a sudden in the second half in 2022, Voth was great. Then, of course, the magic ran out and the Orioles DFA'd him in 2023. However, maybe Heasley can help them in a different way. Because listen. He, at this point in his career, seems like the definition of an up-down, reliever, swingman kind of guy, where he's got options, he's pitched in the big leagues before, he has a big league mix, just doesn't have an elite pitch, but he can give you innings, he can bridge the gap, he can go through a lineup one time out of the bullpen if you need him to, he can make a spot start, and he, at the very least, he can give you depth in AAA. You can put him in the Norfolk rotation, you can put him in the Norfolk bullpen to start the season, you know he has the minor league options, and he can be down there for whenever you need him. Even if you just need an arm for a couple of days, he's an easy guy to call up, and then send right back down if you have to. At the very least, it helps with your depth. And again, if he's staying on the 40-man roster, there's a little more of a question like, all right, he's got to make some moves here. But if the O's are able to DFA him and keep him in the organization, he is a nice piece to have around just for depth. But here's the thing. The Orioles always see something, right? And the fact that they went and jumped on Heasley, because again, he was going to be DFA'd. All signs point to that. But the O's jumped on and said, hey, we'll give you a prospect, right? Just to make sure we get him and none of the teams ahead of us on the waiver wire get him. So that tells me they see something besides the fact that he can just eat innings and be depth. I'm not 100% sure what it is. I think it could be the changeup and working back to that old slider. 
but we shall see. But when you look at how he fits in, the fact that he has a minor league option is another big part of this because the Orioles have relievers who are either going to definitely be on the big league roster to open the year or at least right in the conversation for the big league bullpen who are out of options. Cole Irvin, CNL Perez, Danny Coulomb, Craig Kimbrell, Jacob Webb, and Mike Bauman. All of those guys are out of options. There is a world where all six of those pitchers I just named are six of the eight guys who make the Orioles opening day bullpen. That's not a lot of flexibility to have six of your eight opening day relievers be out of options, which means if they struggle or you need a fresh arm, you can't send them down without putting them on waivers. And all six of those guys, if they somehow ended up on waivers, would be claimed by another team. The Orioles would lose all of them. Now, the O's have other guys who have options. Tyler Wells, D.L. Hall, Dylan Tate, Brian Baker, Aiken, Vespi, Zimmerman, and your Cano. Like, they all have options. So, now some of them aren't going to be. Like, I don't see, hopefully, at any point next year, Cano, Wells, or Hall being sent down at any moment. But you like to have guys who are a little more flexible. Now, at this point, without a move being made, I see the Orioles' projected rotation as Kyle Bradish, Grayson Rodriguez, Dean Kramer, John Means, and Cole Irvin. And my projected bullpen right now, as long as everybody's healthy, would be Kimbrel, Cano, Coulomb, Perez, Wells, Hall, Tate, and Webb. That's four guys with options, four guys without options. Pretty good mix. Now, I am under the assumption the Orioles are going to add at least one more starting pitcher this offseason. That would bump Cole Irvin into the bullpen. And for me, looking at that list, it probably bumps either Dylan Tate or Jacob Webb out, and maybe it bumps Dylan Tate to AAA just to get his feet under him a little bit more to start the year and because he does have options, and Jacob Webb does not. So Heasley is still, like, back of the pack, right? The other options on the bubble even are Brian Baker, Nick Vespi, Tucker Davidson, Keegan Aiken, Mike Bauman, Bruce Zimmerman, like all those guys, and and you could argue, I mean, Heasley might be ahead of Aiken and Zimmerman, and maybe Davidson, I would have to say that that Baker, Vespi, Bauman are all ahead of Heasley at this point. So he's got some ways to go to even get in the conversation for the opening day roster. But here's my prediction. Unless the O's find just incredible, they strike gold with another guy here. Heasley starts the year in AAA, makes some starts, pitches in relief for the Norfolk Tides. And I think he comes up and down multiple times and makes, I'll say, eight appearances, no starts, but eight appearances for the Orioles, just helping them out when they need some innings. They'll try to tweak him, right? They'll try to turn him into a solid middle reliever. And if they don't, again, he'll just be a good depth piece in AAA. Those are always nice to have. Again, they really didn't give up anything. And that's what we're going to get to to finish off the pod coming up next. Yes, it's a trade. And yes, it's disappointing that the O's made a trade for a pitcher and it wasn't Dylan Cease or someone's going to have a huge impact, at least we think, next year. But these moves are okay. These moves don't mean that the Orioles aren't looking to make bigger moves. Sometimes you can just give up a little bit to get a little bit more and improve your team. We'll talk about that to finish off the pod coming up next. So the Orioles made their trade, getting Jonathan Heasley from the Kansas City Royals on Monday. And all they had to do was give up one rookie ball prospect from the Dominican Summer League. Cesar Espinal is the right-handed pitcher who the Orioles gave up, an 18-year-old who the O's signed in their 2022 international class. He pitched down the stretch that year in the Dominican Summer League, 20 innings, struggled a bit, but he was 16 years old. Then he had a really good year. He stayed in the Dominican Summer League in 2023 and actually put up some really good stats. 34 innings, he had a 3.18 ERA, a 25% strikeout rate to just an 8% walk rate, which is really low for a Dominican Summer League pitcher. Those are good stats, and you can see why the Royals said, hey, you know, he's 18 years old, but he had good stats, so yes, we'll take him. And the flip side for the Orioles, you're saying... This is a guy who, even if he were to turn into something, and let me be clear, on the Fangraphs list, on the MLB.com list, on Baseball Prospectus list, on Baseball America list, like there are players who are in rookie ball, in the FCL, in the Dominican Summer League for the Orioles who are on those prospect lists. Even for the Fangraphs list that Eric Longenhagen puts together, like he doesn't just do a top 30. He does a top as many prospects as I feel is necessary to write up. And then he has sections of like 10 plus more players that he just gives a little mention to at the bottom. Espinal has not appeared in any of those lists or publications or write-ups or anything over the past two years since he's been in the O's organization. So it's not like he's seen as like this top, top international guy, right? 
you have to be willing, at the very least, when you are a winning team and just won the division, won 101 games, at the very least, when you're the Orioles, you have to be willing to give up guys who, you know, you might see something. I'm sure they see something in Espinal with those stats this year that say, hey, you know, if he develops this, this, and this, maybe he'll be a big leaguer one day. But to even help your big league team on the fringes. Again, there is a chance that Jonathan Heasley stays in the organization and does not throw a pitch in the big leagues for the Orioles, even if he's healthy in 2024. That is certainly a possibility. But he still helps your organization. He gives you depth. He's a guy who's pitched in the big leagues for the past three years. The Orioles clearly see some things that they can adjust to try and make him more effective. And he's got options and team control. And he makes you even marginally a little bit better in terms of your pitching depth, right? At the very, very least. Espinal is not going to do that this year, next year, the year after that, for years and years and years to come. This is something I talked about when the Orioles made the Jack Flaherty trade at the deadline last year. Like, did that trade work out? No. But it's not because the O's, like, gave up too many prospects. It didn't work out because Jack Flaherty just was not good. He made one good start against Toronto, kind of fell apart, moved to the bullpen, wasn't great there, and basically was a non-factor for the Orioles down the stretch. That is not what they needed out of their starting pitching acquisition at the deadline, but that is what they got. Now, the prospects that they gave up, Drew Rahm and Cesar Prieto and Zach Showalter, yeah, Rahm and Prieto were in AAA, and, you know, Prieto was playing well. Rahm, I felt like it kind of hit a ceiling. I'm not huge believers in either of those guys being impact big leaguers. Now, I think the best big leaguer out of the three they gave up is going to be Zach Showalter. I think there's certainly a future for him to be like a, a good big league bullpen piece as a right-hander with some wicked stuff. But here's the thing. He was a 19-year-old in single-A Del Marva when the Orioles made the trade at the deadline this year. I know they like Zach Showalter, and he was a guy who was in most top 30 lists of the Orioles prospects, and they picked him out of high school, and he's kind of a value pick first day or uh, first pick of the third day of the draft a couple years ago. But you have to be willing to give up on those lottery ticket guys to go get players that you think are going to help you right now. And I get it, right? Jack Flaherty didn't help the O's, and Jonathan Heasley might not help the O's, but you have to be willing to give up those guys if you want to win now. I can understand a little bit more saying, I don't want to trade Colton Kowser. I don't want to trade Heston Kerstad. I don't want to trade Kobe Mayo or Joey Ortiz. Like these guys could help the Orioles right now. Like in the next calendar year, they could help the big league Orioles. I get it. I still think you need to trade some of those guys because A, there's not room for all of them. And B, you can get a lot of big league value out of those guys. You can get proven big league value over, yes, they're good prospects, but they're still unproven in the big leagues. But when you go down like below double A, you should be willing to trade almost everyone who is below the AA level. Now, there's going to be exceptions, right? There's always going to be exceptions. Enrique Bradfield is below the AA level. The Orioles just took him in the first round. I don't think they're really willing to trade Enrique Bradfield right now. Totally understandable. Most of last year, Samuel Basayo, now he's in AA now, but most of last year, Samuel Basayo was below AA. I'd have to think... The Orioles really weren't super willing to trade him. When Jackson Holiday last year was below double way, I, the Orioles were not willing to trade him away. I get it. There's a couple of different scenarios, but most of the time, anybody below that double A level who hasn't gotten there yet, who wasn't ju you know, just drafted like within the last year or just signed, you got to be willing to deal those guys away because they're so far away from helping your big league team. If you're going to get someone who could even possibly help you right now, that trade off is worth it. And that's something here that, yeah, it's not on a big scale. And again, Heasley might not even help the O's at all. But it's at least something you got to do. And again, this doesn't stop them from getting Dylan Cease. This doesn't stop them from going and getting another pitcher. He could be DFA'd off the roster and be a, a, you know, a spring training non-roster invite. He could be just a depth piece. The Orioles aren't relying on Jonathan Heasley. If I'm projecting the Orioles opening day roster... After this trade, I'm not putting Heasley on there. And quite frankly, it's not like he's, you know, next man up. There's still guys like Mike Bauman and Brian Baker and Tucker Davidson that are, you know, even ahead of him on the pitching depth list before Heasley would get an opening day roster spot. He's just depth. I get the jokes, right? Oh, they're going to trade for a pitcher. Oh, it's Jonathan Heasley. I understand. But you go and get depth sometimes. That is what the Orioles did right here. But thank you for tuning in. Remember, we are in the off-season mode here on the podcast. So just three days a week, got a Monday and Tuesday episode this week. Make sure to go back and listen to any you have missed in the past. The last three episodes before this one really broke down the Orioles' new lease and what it means moving forward. There's already some more news coming out. Hayes Gardner of the Baltimore Sun doing some good reporting on Tuesday. The new lease, including some of the ideas the Orioles have for using 
that $600 million they're getting from the state to improve the ballpark. They want to knock out seats in left field, some seats in center, some seats up top behind home plate, and create more social areas where you can kind of stand and gather and watch the game. They also did say, which is a really good sign, a priority for the Orioles with that money is improving the sound system, all the video boards, all the TV screens, and the control rooms in the stadium. That is a great sign, something we are asking for with that money as well. Make sure to go check out those episodes, rate and review us, give us five stars wherever you listen. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. Not sure which day we'll be back, but we'll have one more episode this week coming to you before we get to the holiday weekend, and I'll be back for that one. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.